Hi, this is Professor Brown Cedarberg, and we're going to introduce Java. Java is a very popular programming language. It's really the language of choice today for internet-based applications and for software used in devices that communicate over a network. If you'd like to look at the popularity of Java today relative to other languages, I suggest you go to this site, Tayobi, which ranks programming languages based on the number of lines of code written. Java has been consistent in the number one, number two spot for quite a few number of years. Now, when we talk about Java, it has a history. It was developed in 1994 by James Gosling, and here he is. It was developed when he worked for Sun. Sun has since been acquired by Oracle. Java the language is defined as a general purpose, concurrent, class-based, object-oriented language. The important part of that definition is object-oriented, and we'll talk more about that later. Now, programming languages come in a lot of shapes and sizes. They can be low or high level. A low level language is difficult to look at. It's not very English-like, where a high level language is. They can be compiled or interpreted. And when we look at compiled or interpreted, think of somebody giving a speech in a language you don't understand. If we use the model of compiled, that language would be, that, that speech would be given, all of it. And you'd then have somebody translate the entire speech to you. If we were looking at using interpretation, a line of the speech would be given and then it would be translated for you into a language you understood. Another line of the speech given, translated into a language you understood. That's interpretation. Whatever language you're using, programming languages are just instructions for a computer. And when we talk about instructions for a computer, we're talking about an algorithm. And an algorithm, the term, comes from the name of a Persian mathematician who wrote a very influential book. And his name, I shall try to pronounce, was al Khwarizmi. He looked like this. He's got a stamp in his honor. Now, an algorithm is defined as a solution to a problem through a finite sequence of instructions, a given number of instructions that give us a solution to a problem. In 1966, two computer scientists, Jacopini and Bohm, put forth the theorem that all programming uses these three paradigms. Not paradigms, but these three methodologies, sequence, selection, and repetition. Sequence is the ordered execution of a series of instructions, one after another after another. Selection is I take a different path within my program based on the results of a Boolean test. A Boolean test is something that comes out to either true or false. We call that a condition. And then we have repetition. We loop or repeat something based on the results of a Boolean test, a condition, something that comes out to true or false. If we look at these three graphically, we see that we have sequence, one instruction after another after another, selection, taking a different path based on the results of a, a test, and then looping, repeating something based on the results of a test, or exiting that loop based on the results of a test. Now, structured programming is an older paradigm, and what we did with structured programming is we had a hierarchy of modules, each one had a single entry and a single exit point, and control passed downward through those modules, one after another after another. If we were to look at structured programming graphically, it looks like this. You see it's very simple. Single entry, single exit. Then we had this new way of thinking, a paradigm shift. The paradigm shift brought object-oriented programming. And object-oriented programming is something that's very difficult to describe. If I were to define it, it's a method of programming based on a hierarchy of classes and well-defined and cooperating objects. Well, what does that mean? A class is a program. So I might write a program that's called human. And that program represents all humans. I would then create a clone of that class that I would call an, an instance of the class, and it would be a specific human. So while all humans can do certain things, and we know certain things about humans, height, weight, and that sort of thing, each one of these specific instances would be a specific human. So we'd have a human that was six feet tall, a human that was five feet tall. So when we talk about a hierarchy of classes, classes are programs. Objects are things, things that are specific instances of classes, 
classes define something, and then we have those specific instances of that something. We're going to talk a lot about object-oriented programming. Now, object-oriented programming uses classes, and classes are programs. In those classes, I have methods. Methods are capabilities, things that can be done. In the example of a human, it would be whatever humans can do. Attributes are variables, things we know about, in this example, humans. So it would be height and weight, that sort of thing. The instances are those specific copies of humans, or whatever my class defines. If I look graphically at object oriented programming, I see here I have instances of classes interacting with one another. Now, we're going to look at object oriented programming with Java. Java has a number of versions, three of them. We are interested in the standard edition. The standard edition is what we use to do uh, most programs. The E, the enterprise edition, is for enterprise wide applications. We're not getting get, going to get that big. And ME is for portable devices, we are not going to get that small. Now, we are going to use these three things, the JDK, the JRE, and an IDE. A JDK is software that lets me build my classes, my programs. A JRE lets me run them. So I need a JDK and a J, the JRE to build and then run my programs. Now I can build and run my programs from the command line, but that's kind of Kludgy. So we're going to use an integrated development environment, software, that lets us just write our programs and then call for them to be compiled and call for them to be run very easily in a point-and-click graphical environment. Now, when we talk about computers and programming languages, we have to take the source code, what we write, and put it into a form that the machine, the computer, will understand. So we write our programs and we write what we call source code. That source code has to be either compiled or interpreted into machine code. Machine code is what your computer understands. We represent that, that by ones and zeros. But it's what your computer understands, what your chip can understand, what it'll do. Your machine code is dependent on the architecture of your chip. And architecture is the number and width of the registers in the chip and the instruction code, the, the instruction set that's understood by your computer, your, by your chip. Now, we've said that computer languages are high and low level. We've talked about computer architectures. And we know that a computer architecture is the registers and the instruction set. We know that we have to take whatever we write, be it a low level or high level, and put it into machine code. Now, how do we get Java to machine code? First, we write our code. Our source code is saved in a file with the extension .java. We then compile it. We compile it into what's called bytecode. And bytecode is saved in a .class file. We then, you know, that bytecode, as we've compiled it, is independent of any architecture. It's kind of in a form that'll run on almost any machine. We then interpret that bytecode, and we do that with a Java virtual machine. And it takes that bytecode and turns it into machine code that's understood by the specific machine we're running our program on. That makes Java very portable. This allows us to write once and run on almost any machine. As long as it has that Java virtual machine, that JVM, which is a bit of software, which is included in most browsers, all browsers, right? pretty much. It'll take that dot class and it'll turn it into machine code that's understood by the machine that we're trying to run the program on. Okay? It'll turn it into the machine code. Now, when we code, we're going to write our code, save it as a dot Java. We're going to compile it into a dot class. It then gets loaded into RAM. That's done for us. Then when it's in RAM, it gets verified. That's done for us. And then it'll be executed by the Java virtual machine. It'll take it into machine code. Now, object-oriented programming, we know, 
is a hierarchy of classes cooperating objects. We're not going to have to write every bit of code that we'll use. Java the language comes with a lot of class libraries. Those libraries are a whole bunch of programs, classes, that will do things for us. And they're in what we call the Java API, the Application Programming Interface. That's available to us. It's free. These classes, these programs are available to us. So we don't have to always reinvent the wheel. We'll write a lot of classes, but we'll be using the classes that come with the language. We'll just import them. We'll say, I want to use them. And as we say we want to use them, they'll be available to us. Now, clearly, we'll be creating our own programs, our own classes. We might actually create our own libraries, our own classes that are treated together as a library for anybody to use. So what have we looked at today? We looked at object-oriented language, source code, bytecode, compilation, interpretation.